Hello and welcome to Medent Tutorial. Medent Tutorial and this is Croc 1 2019 booklet. I know you have been waiting for this because exams is just right at the corner. Now, if you don't want to miss any of these presentations, do well to subscribe if you're new and turn on the post notification bell so you don't miss any of the videos we upload over here. Now, thankfully, this is biochemistry based under CROC 1 2019 booklet. So we'll be doing the basis from the booklet. All right, let us start right away. So we have a three-year-old child with elevated body temperature and the person took what? Aspirin. So because of the temperature, uh, aspirin was what's taken. And the person developed increased in hemolysis, hemolysis of the erythrocyte. That means there is breakdown of red blood cells. Now, in this case, hemolytic anemia can be caused by congenital deficiency of the following enzyme. So right now we are looking at what the causative or for what reasons are we having the breakdown of erythrocyte for which we are having hemolytic anemia. Now, it is worth knowing that RBCs or red blood cells are normally protected by what we call glutathione. They are protected by glutathione. And glutathione are also maintained. They are maintained by what we call NADPH. NADPH. That is uh, nicotinamide, adenide, dinucleotide phosphate. NADPH. Now, this NADPH in turn is maintained or is, uh, is made, made possible by what we call uh, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. So, this is what it means. What it means is that when you have glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, you get more of what NADPH. And when you have more of NADPH, you get more of what glutathione. And when you have more of the glutathione, your red blood cells are safe. So this glutathione actually protects the red blood cells from what we call ROS. 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 Reactive. Uh, uh, how do you call it? ROS. Sorry. So these are actually what radicals that are very what, oxidative that can destroy cells, oxidative cells, oxidative uh, substances that can destroy the red blood cells. So this uh, glutathione protects these things, but glutathione cannot work when there is no uh, genesis PD, that is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So what it means is this, when there's a deficiency of this enzyme, that is... Uh, Gene says PD, and I'm sure most of you have heard about it before. Gene says PD. So when there is a deficiency of or congenital deficiency of this enzyme, what it means is that uh, NADPH cannot be produced. NADPH cannot be produced. And when NADPH cannot be produced or will not, are not enough, that means that glutathione cannot also be there. And when glutathione is not there, these reactive... Uh, oxygen species, reactive oxygen species would then destroy our RBCs, our RBCs. So basically over here, we are definitely talking about what? About C, that is a glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase or gene PD deficiency, gene PD deficiency. All right. Collagenosis, you know it already. Patients typically present with connective tissue destruction processes. The presence of these processes can be confirmed by an increase in, for those who have been following my tutorials, you realize that we talk about uh, collagenosis. And anytime we talk about collagenosis, you can think of three things. Think of glycine. Think of what? Lysine. And think of what? Proline. So these substances will be what will be increased either in the urine or in the blood. They will be increased either in the urine or in the what in the blood. So over here 
what can we be looking at for? Definitely, we are looking at for what? For blood oxyproline and oxylysin. Oxyproline and oxylysin. We talk about it more in our previous uh, presentation. So do well to watch the basis. Do well to watch the basis. During diabetes mellitus and starvation, so there is DM and there is starvation, the number of acetone bodies in the blood increases. These bodies are used as a source of energy and are synthesized from the following substances, from the following substances. So what are ketone bodies? Ketone bodies usually, uh, you know, from diabetes, you can get the ketone what bodies. I don't want to enter into the metabolism and uh, how the ketone bodies are being synthesized because that's a whole chemistry on its own. But mainly ketone bodies are readily transported into the tissues outside the liver and are converted to what we call acetyl-CoA. They are converted to what we call the acetyl-CoA. Now, let me just bring your mind to something. Now, the end product of all these acet uh, acetone bodies is to produce what? Energy. Is to produce what energy, and we are saying that these ketone bodies eventually end up uh, producing what we call what acetyl CoA, and you know from the PPH that is pentose phosphate um, uh, pathway, that's PPP. Sorry, not PPH, PPP. Yeah, pentose phosphate uh, pathway. Now, if you can recollect, you know that these uh, acetyl CoA are actually what needed in the Krebs what cycle. It is needed in the Krebs cycle so that energy can be what be produced, can be produced. So definitely over here, what we are looking at for is what is the acetyl CoA. So the sources, the question is, these bodies are used as a source of energy and they are synthesized from the following what substances. They are synthesized from the following what substances. So anytime uh, we are having, uh, how do you call it? Uh, energy production, what we need to know is that acetyl-CoA uh, acetyl must be what? Must be produced eventually. And when these acetyl-CoA are produced, we can be smiling because energy is about what? To come in. And some of them can't be coming or some of them can end up producing what? The acetone what? Bodies. Some of them can end up being produced, uh, can end up producing what we call what? The acetone uh, so the ketone bodies, not yeah, acetone ketone bodies. Basically, they are all the same thing. But we call the ketone what bodies. So please take note of that. And these, uh, as I call it, definitely will enter into the Krebs cycle. And then before you realize, energy is being what is being produced as simple as A B C D. So over here, we are looking at acetyl CoA. So B should be our answer. B should be our answer. Blood test of the patient reveal albumin content of 20 and increased activity of lactate dehydrogenase isoenzyme 5. Again, if you have been watching our presentations on some of these uh, bases, usually biochemistry base, actually, we talk about the different types of what uh, LDH or the lactate dehydrogenase, the LDH lactate dehydrogenase. We talk about type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5, and where in the body you can find them. Some can be found in the muscles, in the liver, in the heart, and other places. All right. But over here, we want to be dealing with what? With LADH5. LADH5. And LADH5 is uh, mainly found in the liver. Found in the liver. So if we have an elevated level of the LADH5, definitely we will be looking at what the liver as our answer. So your answer here should be E. It should be E. All right. A patient presents with an acute attack of cholelithiasis. That is what stones in the gallbladder. Now lab examination of the patient's feces will show the following in this case. Now we've talked, for those who have been following, we've talked about um, types of what, uh, how do you call it, jaundice, the prehepatic, hepatic, and then the post-hepatic. So you can tell 
that from this question, we are definitely talking about what? The post-hepatic or a mechanical type of what? Jaundice. And in mechanical type of what? Jaundice. What do we see? Or what is the color of feces? The color of feces is actually what? Clay. Clay, clay, clay. It's clay, isn't it? Or light colored. Light colored stool. Light colored stool. So what it means is that there is a negative reaction to stecobelin negative reaction, negative reaction, negative reaction. Because the bowel has been what? Been obstructed. Bowel has been what? Obstructed. So we're having what? Uh, e as our answer. Negative reaction to stecobelin. Negative reaction. All right. This is a type of what? Jaundice. Post-hepatic. Now, a patient with diabetes mellitus, after an insulin injection, lost his consciousness and developed convulsion. So the person had DM and you give insulin shot and insulin is supposed to reduce the glucose level because diabetes mellitus, it means there's increased level of what glucose. So when insulin is injected, definitely you are reducing what the glucose. But look at it. The person, this led to what? Loss of consciousness and the person developed convulsion. What will be the result of a mechanical test so a biochemical test for blood glucose level in this case. So the question is, what is one of the effects of insulin injection if care is not taken? Is that it can lead to hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia simply means there's low glucose. So if you look at our options over here, of course, you will be looking at what? At a glucose level of less than three or 3.3, less than 3.3, because I think the normal is about 3.3 to about 5.5. That should be the normal range, 3.3 to about three to about 5.5. So if you have anything less than that, that could be dangerous for us, I mean, for the patient. So A should be our answer. So always be careful when you are giving insulin. Always monitor it, monitor it, monitor it. Examination of a 25-year-old patient Examination of a 25-year-old patient revealed a pathological changes in the liver and the brain. Blood plasma analysis revealed an abrupt decrease in copper concentration. So there's low copper concentration. Urine analysis revealed an increase in copper. Of course, you can't find it in the blood plasma, but you can see it in urine. The patient was diagnosed with Wilson disease, guys. Sorry, Wilson degeneration is because the same as Wilson what disease. And Wilson disease is simply an, it's actually a rare autosomal recessive disorder of copper metabolism, of copper metabolism, whereby there is uh, an excessive deposition of copper in the liver, in the brain, and even other tissues. And sometimes you can find this in the eye. It looks like a ring in the eye. For those who have been watching, uh, uh, Dr. House, <laughs> there, there was a case like that, Dr. House, those who have been watching it. In fact, if you're a medical student, I think you should consider watching some of these series because they really help. They really help. All right. So we have what a real thing is. Now, what's the question? The question is what to confirm the diagnosis, it is necessary to study the activity of the following enzyme in the blood. So you want to look at a copper carrying uh, enzyme copper carrying enzyme and the copper carrying enzyme in all these things is what is the ceruloplasmin 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 so we're definitely looking at what ceruloplasmin this is a copper carrying blood or enzyme yeah basically so the answer is a the gerontology the Gerontology Institute recommends older people to take vitamin complexes that contain vitamin E. What is the main function of this vitamin? Guys, usually vitamin E, actually vitamin E is a fat-soluble antioxidant, 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 and this stops the production of uh, reactive oxygen species, reactive oxygen species. 
you know, when we started the presentation, we talked about something about glutathione and the NADPH and then the GSSPD. So when you don't have, so this vitamin E prevents the production of these substances, the reactive oxygen with species, reactive oxygen. These are radicals. They are radicals. So vitamin E prevent, and you know, as you, as you age, almost every cell in your body begins to age and begins to get weak. So we don't want to cause what? Problems. We don't want to cause what? Problems. So basically, we will be looking at what? An antioxidant. So vitamin E basically is dealing with what? Antioxidant. Antioxidant. So here, we are looking at E as our answer. It is worth knowing that I have, uh, or we have, uh, how do you call it, a website that you can practice all these questions. You can practice them and do quizzes on them. I will send a link or I'll put a link in the description box. That's the Medan website. So I'll put it there so that you can go there. After watching these videos, it's good to also what practice and you practice with explanation. So for every question, you will see explanation under it. And please, if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it. And if you have any comment, please let us know. I mean, any concern, let us know in the comment section as well. All right, let's learn from one another. It's very, very important. Now, ammonia is extremely toxic to the human central nervous system. What is the main way of ammonia neutralization in the nervous system? Ammonia neutralization in the nervous system. So usually ammonia intoxication will occur when we are having a lot of what ammonium in the blood. When we have what, a lot of what ammonium in the blood and that can result or that can happen when neutralization is not being what? It's not being there or it's not being active. And at what point would the neutralization not be there? It's when the capacity, okay, to detoxify the ammonia, usually to, to detoxify it, it forms, it begins to form the glutamate and then the glutamine. It forms glutamate and glutamine. So when uh, this thing exceeds normal, it begins to accumulate inside the brain and the brain doesn't like these substances the brain doesn't like these substances so basically how does the reason okay it will okay by forming what uh, glutamine what synthesis glutamine what synthesis glutamine synthesis but again when this mechanism is compromised what happens is that this ammonia will begin to cause trouble inside the brain. So we want to prevent that as much as what possible. So for ammonia neutralization, of course, the main way is through what? The glutamine what? Synthesis, the glutamine synthesis. But don't forget, the liver also detoxify the body from the ammonia by beginning to form in the urea, the uh, onetin cycle, the urea and all those stuff. We'll, we'll get to those places, all right? We'll get to those places, so don't be in a hurry. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. So over here, we are looking at what? Glutamine synthesis. Glutamine synthesis. So your answer is D. People who for a long time remained in hypodynamic state developed intense pain in the muscle. Intense pain after a physical exertion. What is the most likely cause of this pain? This needs no introduction. You guys know this, like, I don't know. You know it, guys, you know it. So basically, what, is, what does it mean? What it means is that when you are doing exercise, the reason why there are pains in the muscles is because there's a formation of what? Lactic acid, exactly, lactic acid. So don't waste your time on these questions like this. Just quickly answer and go. So over here, accumulation of lactic acid in the muscles. The human genetic apparatus consists of approximately 30,000 of genes, while the number of antibody variants can be as high as millions. What mechanism leads to the formation of a new 
of new genes that ensure the synthesis of such a number of antibodies, such a number of antibodies. So more or less like, um, let me just say, producing offsprings, okay, producing offsprings, producing offsprings. So usually what it means is that, you know, genetically, uh, copies from your mom, copies from your dad come together to form you or to form the what the offspring. So one way by which we can continue the status of this is by what we call genetic recombination. Genetic recombination. So we can be having different variants of species or different variants of offspring. So in this case, different variants of what antibodies, different variants, and that's because of what genetic recombination genetic recombination genetic recombination that's over here we are looking at d as our answer d as our answer chronic overdose of glucocorticoids leads to the development of hyperglycemia in a patient glucocorticoids are prednisolones i mean Example is penicillin. What do they do? They stimulate gluconeogenesis. Glucocorticoids stimulate gluconeogenesis. That is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate substances. And what it means is that there will be an increased level of what? Of blood sugar and even dipolysis, lipolysis, lip or breakdown of fat. Breakdown of what? Fat. Because fat has to be broken down so it can be converted into what? Into glucose, isn't it? From non carbohydrate. All right. So over here, we are looking at what? What is the question is what? Name the process of carbohydrate metabolism that result in elevated, of course, gluconeogenesis. So your answer should be B. A patient for a long time was on an imbalanced diet. Sorry, was on an imbalanced diet, okay, low in protein, which resulted in hepatic fatty infiltration. That is hepatic steatosis, if you can remember. Now, this condition is likely to develop if a person's substance, if a certain substance is absent in the patient's diet, name this substance. Again, we are dealing with hepatic steatosis, which is simply the accumulation of fat in the liver. Accumulation of fat in the liver. And we said this occurs when the, 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 the cells are deprived of what we call choline. Choline, choline. And talking about choline, we are also talking about what? Phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine or methionine. Methionine. So again, either there's deficiency of uh, choline or phosphatidylcholine or methionine. These are the cases by which we can have what hepatic steatosis, hepatic steatosis. And that's so over here, definitely we are going to be looking at what methionine. So E would definitely be our answer. Don't forget, there was a question on croc, similar question on croc. And I think the answer was to do with choline. Another co question is to do with what phosphatidylcholine. That is why I'm just mentioning all of these things so that you don't get yourself confused with any one of them. All right. So a patient who has been subsisting exclusively on a polished rice has developed polyneuritis, polyneuritis due to timing and deficiency. What substance is an indicator of such a vitaminosis which when it is excreted with urine? Guys, we're talking about what? Vitamin, sorry, timing deficiency. And timing means vitamin what? B1, vitamin B1, vitamin B1. So, Vitamin B1, and we know that vitamin B1 is always present in pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase. So vitamin B1 more or less serves as a cofactor, cofactor for 
pyruvate dehydrogenase activation. Isn't it? So what it means is that when this uh, vitamin is not there, that means we are having what? A pyruvic acid that is not activated. So when the pyruvic, uh, the pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid is not activated, what, did, what, 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 what will happen? Of course, they'll be excreted. They will be what? Excreted. They'll be excreted. And of course, the other aspect of it is the, the is it 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 helps the neurons. Okay, the neurons. So when these vitamins are not there, of course, there can be what? Polyneuritis as well. So over here, we are looking at what? Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid. So your answer should be A. A 40-year-old man with a pulmonary tuberculosis was prescribed with isoniazide, of course. Prolonged taking of this drug can result in the development of the following vitamin deficiency. So first of all, you must understand one of the side effects or the adverse effect of isoniazide. And one of the adverse effects of isoniazide uh, is development of neuropathies. Development of neuropathy, or even causing neuritis, 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 just like we talked about in the previous uh, something, I mean, in the previous question. Okay, but this isoniazide is basically dealing with, uh, uh, how do you call it? Vitamin B6, vitamin B6, vitamin B6, vitamin B6. So vitamin B6 is also the same as what? Uh, pyridoxine, pyridoxine, pyridoxine. So for the, and that's what normally when you are giving isoniazide, we give it and then we add a supplement of vitamin B6 so that the side effect of the isoniazide would not come to pass or will not start showing because you have already supplemented the person with vitamin what? B6 or pyridoxine. So over here, we are definitely looking at what? Vitamin B6 deficiency, also known as what? Pyridoxine. So C should be our answer. C should be our answer. Disturbed activity of trepsin and chemotrepsin it leads to a disturbed breakdown in the small, in, sorry, leads, yeah, disturbed breakdown. Now, the activity of these enzymes depends on the presence of the following factor. The presence of the following factor. So, actually, these are actually what? Proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes, in this course, basically produced from the pancreatic juice. Produced from what? The pancreatic what? juice. So, however, majority of these enzymes are, come. I mean, the most abundant don't forget we have the trypsin and the chemotrypsin, but the most abundant is the what the trypsin. However, trypsin is activated by enterokinase. So it converts trypsinogen, which is actually an inactive form, to a trypsin. Again, enterokinase, uh, don't forget, and the enterokinase are also produced from the duodenum not from the pancreas, they are produced from the duodenum. They are produced from the duodenum and it converts inactive form of trypsinogen to an active form called what? Trypsin. So the question is what? The activities of these enzymes would depend on what? Of course, the presence of what? Enterokinase. Because if these, these enzymes can only become active when what? Enterokinase are there. And that's over here. Your answer should be B. Your answer should be B. Again, if you're enjoying this tutorial, please don't forget to like this, share, and tell your friends about this awesome thing. And again, if you want to practice more, please do what to check on our website and I'll put a link in the description. Do ask your questions as well and we are here to help you. All right. A newborn present with weak suckling, weak suckling, frequent vomiting and hypotonia. Blood and urine citrulline are very high, guys. So this one, looking at what? The citrulline. What metabolic process is disturbed? So usually citrulline is made from ornithine 
cycle or it means from what from ornithin from ornithin or uh, carbamoyl phosphate carbamoyl phosphate carbamoyl phosphate and this is part of what you call the urea cycle you know what i'm talking about the urea urea what cycle ornithin urea cycle citrulline please get that citrulline uh, ornithin urea cycle urea what cycle so what does it do or what does this help us so what this cycle helps us is that it excretes ammonia it helps us to excrete ammonia by converting it into urea by converting it into what urea don't confuse this with neutralization of what the ammonium or the ammonia which is what glutamate or glutamine so don't confuse that with urea because urea, when the ammonia is converted to urea to be excreted, Sorry. to be excreted. Very good. So over here, what is it? The question is, what metabolic process is disturbed? Of course, we are talking about the ornithine cycle or the urea cycle. Urea cycle, ornithine cycle, citrulline. Please don't forget these things. Don't forget these things. So the answer is A. Patients with ischemic heart disease are usually prescribed small doses of aspirin. Small doses of what? Aspirin. This drug inhibits the synthesis of platelet aggregation activator. That's thromboxine A2. What substance is this activator synthesized from? What? Uh, the, sorry, what substance is this? Act, yeah. So where is this synthesized from? Where is this synthesized from? So, and of course, if you know how the, the COX-1 and COX-2 work, this is a bonus question for you. This is a bonus question for you. So usually aspirin. So aspirin is actually what? A non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drug and this is a non selective inhibitor of cox e sorry of cox 1 and cox 2 that is cyclooxygenase cyclooxygenase cox 1 and on cox 2 okay and then these cox 1 and cox and uh, cox 2 are substances or they are let me say enzyme not yeah they are enzymes that participate in prostaglandin synthesis. They participate in prostaglandin synthesis from arachidonic acid. From so what it means is that when we have arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid, arachidonic acid. So first of all, it's what from phospholipids, from phospholipids, from phospholipids to Arachidonic acid, then from arachidonic acid, then of course we can start thinking of what of our prostaglandins. For prostaglandins, prostaglandins. All right. So now I'm just concerned you see over here. So over here we have what the COX1 and then the COX2. The COX2. So what aspirin does is that it blocks this pathway. It blocks this pathway. It blocks this pathway. So what it means is that arachidonic acid cannot lead to the production of what? Of prostaglandins, of prostaglandins, prostaglandins. Good. And this is the reason why when usually you have to ask the patient, if the patient is uh, having any stomach problems like uh, ulcer or stuff like this, because of this mechanism, because of this mechanism, because of this mechanism. So when prostaglandins are not produced, which we know that prostaglandins also serve as a protective lining in the in the stomach muc uh, mucosa layer, in the stomach or the gastric mucosa layer, they serve as a protective lining. So when this pathway is blocked, we can have people suffering from water from ulcer. So always ask your patient, what is happening to them if they have any history of ulcer or any gastritis or any problem of such thing. 
All right. So the question is, what substance is this activator synthesized from? So basically, we can be looking at what? At arachidonic acid. Arachidonic what? Acid. Arachidonic acid. So over here, our answer should be what? Should be C. Arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid. I don't know how Ukrainians set their questions, but the question is a little bit confusing. Okay. A little bit confusing. So basically, what it blocks is that it blocks this arachidonic acid. <laughs> Basically, it blocks it. Anyways, this is Ukraine. So we move. So let's move. <laughs> All right. So a patient with myocardial infarction in the acute phase, so MI acute phase, has been hospitalized into the cardiolo cardiology unit to induce platelet lysis. That means platelet breakdown. In the patients, in the patients' coronary vessels during the early hours of infection, the end the following enzyme should be used. So now we have a patient with what myocardial that MI. Of course, it could be because of what there's no enough blood that's entering into the what into the cardiomyocyte. So there's what an infection. Okay, so now we want to induce the breakdown of platelets. Or the aggregation of what of platelets. Basically, that is what we want to do. So we're looking for what, a thrombolytic medication, thrombolytic or thrombolytic medication, and a thrombolytic medication that we can be looking at for in this question is streptokinase. 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 So your answer here should be what a streptokinase is a thrombolytic medication at the same time an enzyme. All right, so you can look at it more later. So in the hematology unit, a patient with leukemia was prescribed with 5-fluoracil. Fluoracil, this drug. So what is this drug? Why, why, why are we giving 5-FU? 5-FU, 5-FU. So now if you can remember uh, correctly, this uh, 5-FU is actually thymidylate synthase, thymidylate synthase inhibitor. That means thymine synthesis inhibitor. Thymine synthesis inhibitor. Thymine synthesis inhibitor. So interrupting the action of this enzyme will block the synthesis of pyrimidine thymidine. Thymidine, which is a nucleotide that is required for DNA replication. It is required for DNA replication or DNA what synthesis. It's required for DNA what synthesis. So if you block uh, this pathway, that is done. So over here, we are going to deal with what? With uh, uh, inhibition of what DNA Synthesis because it's a nucleus. Don't forget of don't forget your purines. Don't forget your we've discussed them. Don't forget your purines and what the pyramidines. Pyramidines. Don't forget them. Pyramidines. Don't forget these things. Don't forget these things. Where we can talk about the AG. Don't worry. Let me not go deep. All of these things. So there's what Uracel. I mean, fluoracil, fluoracil. So in fluoracil, we're basically what? Inhibiting DNA synthesis. And that will help us to control the leukemia. Because in leukemia, we are having what? Unregul unregulated proliferation or synthesis, isn't it? We are having unregulated synthesis or proliferation. So over here, if you give this person this drug, it will block the the, the replication or the synthesis. Yeah. All right. A five year, a seven year old girl has signs of anemia. Lab examination revealed pyruvate kinase deficiency in erythrocyte. What process is disturbed, guys? What process will be disturbed? Now, why do we need pyruvate kinase? Pyruvate kinase help us to enter into the Krebs cycle. And in Krebs cycle, to produce what energy, and to produce energy in Krebs cycle, you need what oxygen. 
So pyruvate uh, kinase is actually used in aerobic glycolysis. But since pyruvate kinase is deficient, then definitely we are looking at what anaerobic glycolysis in a way to produce what energy. Anaerobic glycolysis. That is absence of what oxygen. We know that RBCs or erythrocytes do not have oxygen or they don't even have mitochondria. Yeah. They don't have mitochondria. So if they don't have mitochondria, the other way of producing energy is through what? Anaerobic glycolysis. So here we are looking at D, 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 anaerobic glycolysis. Examination of a patient shows a decreased leukocyte, decreased leukocyte and erythrocyte count and low hemoglobin levels in the peripheral blood, as well as the appearance of large cells, guys. So this is your major clue, megaloblastic or megaloblast. What vitamin deficiency? Megalo so basically talking about anemia, isn't it? So megaloblastic anemia, megaloblastic anemia or macrocytic anemia. What comes to mind? Of course, you are thinking of either what... Uh, uh, how do you call it, Seth? Vitamin B12, vitamin B12, or you're thinking of what? Folic acid. Folic acid. So these are the things that are division of these things can lead to what? Megaloblastic anemia. So you look at your answer. What will be your right question? I mean, your right answer or choice? Of course, folic acid, folic acid, folic acid. Again, do not forget to subscribe to this channel. <laughs> do not forget it. And turn on the post notification bell so you don't miss any video we post. Don't forget we are planning on doing the 2020 as well before clock. So stay glued to this channel. All right. When the king or Vinakin Kosakov, when the Kosakov syndrome often develops in chronic alcoholics who have a low vitamin diet, decreased transketolates. Ketolates activity can be observed in the course of this disease. What vitamin deficiency causes this development? Guys, we are looking at what? Kosakoff syndrome. Kosakoff syndrome. And Kosakoff syndrome is basically when there is what, too much um, deficiency of what? Timing. Too much deficiency of what? Timing. Timing, which is what vitamin B1. Vitamin B1. So basically, that is it. That is. So either you're having beriberi, so beriberi, uh, Kosakoff syndrome, optic neuropathy, Lynch disease, generally all of these things, they are sort of what timing, sort of timing, timing. So over here, we are definitely looking at what a timing as our answer. Please practice more of these questions on the Medent website. And I'm going to put a link in the description for you. All right, great. All right, guys. So this brings us to the end of the first part of 2019 booklet, Clock One 2019 booklet. So watch out for the next one. Stay blessed.